One of the things that we tend to do quite often in the beginning of our artistic journey is to look at some really, really amazing art and question simply, how on earth did they do that? And this brings up a really, really important aspect of the creative journey and creative practice. The difference between finished result and the process that is used by the artist to get that finished result. The classic manifestation of this is, of course, the what pencil do you use question, the what brush do you use question. There are a lot of wrinkles to this, not least the fact that often hiding process, hiding the way that things are actually made is a major part of making things look finished. Often, the reason that we don't understand how things are made is because that is a fundamental way that you make things look good. Leaving this area unexamined, focusing too much on which pencil, which brush pack, which paper can lead to a huge amount of both frustration and really never being able to actually get to that finished result in the first place. Not to mention that when we really immerse ourselves in the idea of process, in the act of creation, it's actually pretty forgiving and quite a lot of fun. Welcome to the Visual Scholar Podcast. My name is Tim McBurney. I have been a professional working artist for over 20 years. And on this show, we're all about demystifying the worlds of art, creativity, and productivity so that you can get better faster and enjoy your artistic journey. So what I want to do is look at this from a couple of different angles. But firstly, I'm just going to define a lot of what we actually mean by process. I think this is really interesting because I've got a couple of different components of it that I think are better left separated. And I think if we do it this way, it leads to a lot of really interesting insights into how people get finished work. Now, secondly, I just want to sort of reiterate and look at the problem that people often actually encounter and the way that often society kind of tends to hide process from us. Like th there's a reason that often we're not keyed into looking behind the curtain for how these things are actually done. And that's not actually the first question we ask. The first question we tend to ask is, what's the tool, right? Which pencil do you use? I, I think there are reasons for that. And examining that, I think, can give us insight into how better to sort of engage in creative practice. And lastly, I just want to look at how we actually do embrace the idea of process and a lot of the benefits and, quite frankly, creative freedom and fun that you can get from doing that. And as usual, right at the end, I'll do some simple takeaways so that you can figure out how to apply a lot of this more philosophical and intellectual stuff to your actual day-to-day -day work. So what is process? What, what am I talking about? Now, you, you probably have a pretty good idea, good idea of what I'm talking about here. Often when we are aspiring artists and you see art that you really like, we, we're enamored with the finished result. We're enamored with the product, with the thing, with the emotions, with the feeling that it gives us. This could be a book cover, a video game, a comic, some art you see on the wall somewhere, a public installation, whatever it is, whatever kind of art you like, sculpture, it, it really doesn't matter. We're often enamored by the finished result. And that's very different from the way that it is actually created. The way I like to look at this as is as a magic trick. I think a magic trick and viewing this through the veil of magic, I think is a good way to understand often how these things are happening. And I think this goes for not just art, but most things that are created. There is the trick, and this is the thing that we see. This is the finished result. This is the effect. And then there is how the trick is actually done. And in most cases, it's not just that the magician doesn't want to tell you how the trick was done. It's that we as the viewer also don't want to know how it's done. And I think in many ways, this is something we'll unpack as we sort of progress into the, you know, sort of second main point that I have here. But often people don't actually want to know how the things that they're consuming are created because it ruins a lot of the magic. There's a couple of really key points here that I think are worth sort of examining. Fundamentally, process is how we get from A to B. It's how you get from an, an idea or a very vague thought, a feeling, an emotion, 
a little sort of splinter or glimmer in your mind's eye to a finished product. And the finished product is the thing that the viewer, the consumer, the person who's looking at our art experiences. And they see something very different to what we see. I've often talked about the paradox of process in this regard in that the image that you have in your mind's eye before you've created something is very different to the image and the way you experience the work as you're creating it through process. And then once you're finished with it and you put it out into the world, you also view it differently. So there's three versions of the image and that work that an artist really experiences very fully. The viewer, the consumer only views one essentially. And often again, it's the context and the way that that work is presented and explained that has a massive impact on how they feel about it. So let's look at this idea and I'll sort of break this down and I'll use the metaphor here of gallery work because I think this often speaks to a lot of the romanticism that we have about art and the way that looking at the finished result and the way that this is viewed on a gallery wall very much changes the way that people sort of perceive work and how it's sort of finished and also the story and the narrative that's told about the artist and how that affects the finish as well. But I think there's three different aspects to the way that we go through process. I think there's the ideation process, there's the creation process, and then there is the presentation process. And depending on what type of art you're doing, this could also go for commercial. So, so I'll, I'll sort of maybe use a tandem metaphor of like gallery work and creating a comic book because as you know, creating comic books is just something I kind of have in, in my brain. It's something I know the process of. When you're looking at a piece of art, let's say you're looking at a piece of fine art, a la Picasso, he's a good example of how these stories are told about the work. Or you may pick up a comic book and this is the thing you see. This is the thing we like. Now, I think there's an art and a process to the way that those things are presented after they're created that is really important. There is the marketing effort of that book. There is the story that's told that leads up to it. There is the story that's told about the creators. There is the way that you're made to feel excited about it as a general sort of sales effort. And the sales and the marketing is art to a certain degree. It really does change the way that you view and get excited about something. And often this is part of why we actually engage in these things in the first place. So there's the actual work itself and then there's the way it's presented. There's the way you have to wait for it to pick it up on a Wednesday at your comic book store or the way that you would wait for it to appear on the newsstand. There's the anticipation of the work. This goes into how we feel about it and the way that we sort of think it's good or bad. In a similar way, if we work backwards from a gallery show, there's a lot of pomp and sophistication and presentation that goes into a gallery showing or having a museum. I mean, often these museums do really play on the value that these pieces of art have. If you go to a gallery showing, you often go to a ceremonial opening of the gallery where there's fancy food and everyone dresses up and you get to meet the artists and there are other fancy, sophisticated, important people there. And, and people often go to these things to feel a particular way. You see this thing on the wall. It's framed. It's perfectly framed in a mat. It's got a nice frame around it. It's lit nicely. There are other people around it. We're all appreciating it. We're sipping out, maybe at you know, a fancy gallery show, it's really expensive, free wine. There's a particular feeling there. And that's really separate to the fact that the actual creation of these things would just be, in the case of a piece of art on the wall, it's just a bit of paper, right? In the artist's studio, it's just a bit of paper, right? It, it does not framed. It has no story. It has, has no narrative. We're not even sure whether it's finished or whether it's half done, whether it's successful. But when you frame it, when you put a frame around art, it is finished and it has a particular sense of pageantry and drama. And so that's when I talk about the process of presenting it. In the same way, a comic book is just, it's just a stack of sort of dirty paper. There's often ink 
stains all over the page, there are often correction marks that are made in whiteout or some sort of white paint. And you actually look at it and most of them look kind of messy. I mean, if you have an appreciation for the original art, that's one thing. But in most cases, that art is not actually made to be presented on a wall. It's production. The artwork is the finished product. It is the comic book that you see. You don't see all of the artist proofs, all of the messy corrections, the editing, the spelling mistakes. They're just the pile of paper, the uninspiring mechanistic way that it is created. We see the finished result and that's what we get excited about. So this is very separate to what artists actually do. So if we look at the process of production, this is where we're often in fairly sort of dusty, dark, dank studios, artistic studios. These, these are often functional spaces. There's a certain degree, and this is something we'll also unpack, where people like to increase the visual appeal and the, and the sort of feeling. Again, they, they a lot of artists these days, especially on Instagram and TikTok, etc., have a way of presenting the way that they're creating art as a little bit of an art unto itself, which I think is a really, really key, important idea. And they kind of spend a lot of time making their studio very fancy. Some artists have fancy studios. Some people just have kind of rooms full of paper. That's pretty much what mine is like. And, you know, this is a very functional space. It's like a workshop. You look at someone who makes a wooden chair, um, a master craftsperson who makes wooden things. The, the studio, the workshop is full of sawdust. It's full of glue. It probably smells like those things. It smells like the oil on the tools. It smells like, you know, the burning of, uh, you know, sort of drills going through things. It may be hot, it may be cold, but the thing that comes out of it is this really nice chair. And you can put that chair, you know, in the Louvre, potentially. It, it, it is a work of art. It's finished. A good chair, you, you probably don't even understand how it's made. You don't understand how it's glued together, whether it even is glued together. These things are hidden from us. And I think that's a really important thing to understand. The artist workshop, the comic book artist's studio is often a mechanical functional place where we're taking bits of paper and we're using our process and our medium to messily in any way, shape or form that we can get the desired result. If you look at the mechanistic nature that, you know, again, the Mona Lisa is just some paint on a canvas. It's a very different paint on a canvas when it's in the Louvre and it's presented, you know, under bulletproof glass and it's got a fancy frame around it. But fundamentally, these are just bits of paper. And the way that they're created is through manipulating these bits of paper. It's messy. And even, you know, a lot of art has processes where you have to mask off certain parts of it, you know, and it all gets messy. And then you kind of like take the, the masking tape away. And finally, there it is. It looks really sort of polished. In all of these cases, there is a messiness. There is a functionality to the actual creation of anything where you go from, okay, I know what I'm doing. Now I actually have to make it, whether you're making a chair, a comic book, or something that's going to end up in a fancy sort of gallery, a fancy museum. Either way, these are very functional things and the way that they're created, the way that you produce them, the stages that it goes through often bear little to no resemblance to the finished result. And there's a good reason why people often do like to hide these because it's not quite as romantic. I think it's also good to look at the first stage of creation, which is the idea phase. I think that there is often a process to coming up with ideas, refining ideas from nothing to having it in a really usable form. Artists who are professional artists are often working in production. So we really deal with the middle bit, not the marketing and the sales, the presentation, the framing, the lighting, the buying of the wine, the inviting of the important people. We deal with the making of the actual thing. That's our skill set. That's what's important to us. But also there is often an ideation process, a thought process whereby you say there is an infinite number of things that could be created here, literally an infinite number. And I have a blank canvas. Anything is possible. 
what are we going to make? And I think that really examining that process as well and understanding that that too is a creative process in a similar way that it may be messy in a workshop to come up with a finished product, a finished painting, a finished book, a finished chair, product, whatever. It's also messy and it has a particular functional way that often an idea will be turned from nothing into something, into a stage where you could actually produce it. Now, how that happens is very unique. And I think the ideation process is much more unique than the production process because it really only exists in the substrate and the media of our mind and the way that you can manipulate ideas and come up with ideas and define what you're actually going to do is very, very unique to you. When you're working practically, you're taking that idea from thought space into reality. And although there are very many unique ways that you can create artwork, I think that fundamentally you're restricted by the medium you're using. You, you have pencils, pens, with a comic book, you need to create a storyboard, pencils, inks, color, whatever your process is. But the idea phase is a lot more amorphous. But nevertheless, I think inside our mind or um, the writer's mind, people who spend a lot of time in the thought process of creation, and this would be your artists like Picasso, it would be someone who is an auteur, someone who is maybe conceiving of writing and drawing and creating their own book. But this is often a process that still is hidden from us as production artists. And I think understanding and going deep into that initial ideation process is often how you can unlock a lot of your power as an artist. It often seems in the same way that you may begin as an artist saying, wow, I really like how this thing is looks. How, how do I do that? And you figure out how to do that. But we focus on the practical production of it as artists in many cases. And often we feel like we are not the kind of people who can actually come up with ideas. And you probably don't know the right questions to ask about how would you come up with ideas? It's the same thing. But there are processes and systems and frameworks for doing all of these things. And I think if you really can combine all of these ideas, that is when you become more like a magician. You can create the entire thing. The magic trick is a good metaphor for how a lot of this functions. You have to come up with an idea. And if it's not an original idea, it's probably not going to be very magical. But if you can come up with an original idea and then you can through process figure out how to actually do it, and then go through the presentation, the actual performance of the trick, and you perfect all of these things, a good idea, a very good implementation of that idea, and then a very good presentation of that idea. That's when you get this magical feeling, like just something really, really good is happening, and no one really knows how or why. So that's a little bit airy-fairy. From a practical standpoint, a good way to look at process is from an artist's point of view, because I'm imagining we're artists here. You're probably a visual artist of some kind if you're listening to this. You often have many different weird ways that art is created. For instance, often painting, particularly oil painting or a build-up medium, has a, a beginning where you start with a tonal rough block in. You actually start by creating a color painting and you do that by creating in black and white first. And often it is actually created with a sepia block in in the beginning. So it sort of looks red and orange and, you know, sort of yellow. And then we put color on top of that. And there are reasons from a process standpoint why, even though you often don't see a lot of that in the finish, that that is there. And unless you really sort of look into it and understand why and how that process works, it's going to be very difficult to get the finished result you want without that type of process. Likewise, you often see, and this is one of the things I'm often prattling on about when I'm trying to teach fundamental drawing, is to understand that in most cases, creating a finished piece of art involves multiple passes of the drawing. When we start drawing, again, you look at amazing art, you think, oh, that's really well drawn. And then you just sort of start drawing in your sketchbook and you're wondering, like, why doesn't my work look like that? It's like, well, because that work is often created in a studio and the artist has created 10 versions of that drawing before. They've done studies of it. 
they've prepared, they may have gotten reference, they may have not got reference, they probably do it small three or four times, they then transferred that onto a large thing, and then they refined it further. And the painting process that I was talking about is a way of refining the actual drawing and construction of an image. So it's not just one drawing, it's 10 drawings, it's 20 drawings, it's multiple iterations, it's understanding that process that often creates the finished result that you're looking at. Likewise, there are a lot of basic processes that define how art is created. A good way to look at the duality of that would be some ways that art is created is fundamentally created from light to dark. I, you put the, the dark values in first and then you build it up. You put lighter and lighter values on it until you get to the highlights. You may start it from the middle, right, as well. And the other sort of common one would be like a watercolor where you're actually going from light to dark and you're sort of leaving the light color of the paper in there as the highlight. These are fundamentally different ways of thinking about the creation of work and the way that the art will look step by step in the beginning, at the end, in the middle, the way it will feel is very, very different. And it'll be tricky to get the same result with a different sort of process in terms of going from light to dark or dark to light. So hopefully that gives us a pretty good idea of what I'm actually talking about when it comes to process. The easiest way to think about it is that this is actually what you do day to day when you're an artist. This is what we actually do. So what's the problem here? As I said, it seems to be, from my experience, spending over a decade trying to teach people drawing and art in various capacities in professional full-on school environments where people are fully dedicated to teaching online courses, to people asking me questions randomly um, in email, and just talking about this a lot. Most of my friends are professional artists who have done this. And the thing that I really do find is that in the beginning, most people do overlook the importance of the actual process to how good they're going to get and how this is actually going to affect their improvement and the way that this is actually what you spend your time doing. People are often trying to avoid this step as opposed to really going deep and appreciating it and learning it. It's viewed as, oh, yeah, 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 I, I, I don't really want to do the perspective. I don't really want to block this in. I, I don't really want to have to draw it two times. Like, I, I understand that's kind of what you want to do and like, I, I kind of get it, but I'm in some ways I'm maybe special or I'm just kind of not going to do that or I can't be bothered or I'm going to do it another way. And I think that's just a fundamental misunderstanding that like, no, no, that's what you do. If, if you look at, you know, animation, for example, what animators need to do in traditional 2D animation is do a huge amount of drawings and it's an iterative process. They start out rough, they clean it up, they clean it up. Um, and you know, it's that process that you actually spend all your time doing. You're not just drawing finished frames in the same way. You're not just often drawing finished comic book panels. You're thinking about the story, what the character's thinking, what they're doing, how this panel is going to relate to something else. And then you're figuring out, okay, how do I construct that? How do I, you know, figure out where the camera is? And then how do I draw that? And then last comes the actual finished lines. And fundamentally, there is just seems to be an avoidance of this topic and a lack of desire to really go deep and, and figure this out. And I, I think there's actually quite a few good reasons for this. I don't think this is anything that you should feel bad about. I Fundamentally, this just isn't taught in school. The idea of production, the idea that things are produced is not really part of the traditional educational paradigm. We're not taught to look at how to be a scientist and the process that you would go through to discover something. Often what we're taught is the results of all of the scientific experiments that have been created. And we're often given a little fake version of process where you say, oh, you can come up with a hypothesis and then you can, you know, define an, an exercise, uh, an experiment to maybe sort of prove or disprove that hypothesis. And then you kind of do it. But there's a whole bunch of other processes and ideas and things that you would go through as someone who is actually doing new evolution of science that is completely different to that. It's a completely different thought process. And in a similar way, we often study literature. And this tells us how to critique 
work, but doesn't teach us how to write work. There's very few, even creative writing classes often don't really teach you how to do creative writing. A lot of it is criticism. It's breaking down. It's post-rationalizing why things are happening because that's the best way to fit it into an educational paradigm where you can write and speak and verbally understand and then prove that you understand a thing as opposed to really understanding the messy production process. This is often defined as a craft or something that people do that is sort of technical. And I think there's often a massive gap here just when it comes to really figuring out how things are done. It's actually very challenging to teach this type of real creativity and real kind of taste and really figuring out like, okay, how do I take my ideas and turn them into something? It's very challenging to do that. It takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of personal effort. And I think it's just something that isn't possible with most sort of current modern or even sort of, you know, old educational paradigms. It's really not what they're designed to do. They're just designed to pass on information. So we tend to sort of skim over this as, you know, in the beginning. And I think that's important to state. It's important to understand that this is not something you're typically taught. And again, I think there are reasons for that as well, because in most cases, people tend to specialize in one or two things. We often have a career path where we kind of know how some things are produced, but part of our job is actually to hide how those things are produced. So for instance, if you're looking at yourself as a student going into a classroom, and this is how you're taught to understand the world, you're presented a finished classroom. You're presented a lecture. The teacher walks in the room, and I know this because I've done it and I've seen behind the curtain of how a lot of this stuff happens and how universities and schools are run. But I step into the room and I have something prepared. Hopefully, probably in my case, not that well prepared, but I have something prepared. We have curriculum, we have a lot of arguments and discussions that happen behind closed doors about what is and what is not going to be taught. But what we present is a very united front, a polished, finished product. Oh, this is what we're going to be doing today, class. You just need to do this and this and this. Here's your worksheet. That is the product behind the scenes of your school is complete mess. It is complete chaos. It is process. It is giant bits of paper, people writing and rewriting curriculum, arguing about what will and won't be included based on a huge variety of things. It's a mess. But we don't understand that. We don't, we're not taught that because the school system in itself and most things are actually a product, right? They are a finished result. And we're not often taught what goes on behind the scenes. And we're not taught that in most cases because we don't want to know. There is a sense of the magical magic show here. You're going to see something. You're sitting down in a seat. You're looking at an educational environment. You don't really want to know. If you buy something, what you're interested in is the story of the product. You are interested in what it does for you. If that product has been marketed well, that's what you're interested in. You're interested in how it is going to help you. You're interested in, we're interested in ourselves, in, in how this is going to make us happy. We don't really want to know how it was made. And in most cases, that would probably just confuse the product or detract from it. And, you know, you can see how companies and, and products and things that are created that do a really good job of this tend to succeed really well. And ones that focus too much on the craft and looking at sort of the process and like, oh, you know, we created it this way and this is why it's interesting. This is why you should care is most people don't care. They just care about what they can actually do with it. And I think this pervades all of society where we kind of actually like these magic tricks. We like to buy a chair and put it in our house and think about how good it is. And we may think, we may, have, we may be told a story about, oh, this is made by a master woodworker, a craftsperson of the highest esteem. They work here, and you may have a photo of their workshop on the brochure or something. And this fuels a little story that is told about the production. But you probably wouldn't want to actually go there on any given day and see how it's made because it would just be a whole bunch of sort of messy wood everywhere. And it's a lot of sanding and varnishing and, 
you know, menial work, right? Sometimes it's interesting, but in most cases, a lot of stuff just involves many menial steps and lots of process, lots of work, lots of just sort of doing stuff. It's the same thing where people don't want to know how the sausage is made. You don't want to know what's in your fast food hamburger. You just want to enjoy the thought of it, the way it's marketed. And again, you know, the way that it tastes, you don't want to know what's in there. The other thing is that it has been pointed out many, many times that society tends to focus on big events. It tends to focus on things that succeed. It tends to focus on good stories. It doesn't tell you the million times that the people who are trying to do this thing or create this product failed and the struggles that they encountered. People tend to not want to know about that stuff in general. It's not really a fun, interesting story. And I think this just means and it leads to this fundamental thing where people just generally don't know and don't want to know how most things in their life are created. It's too much information. So when you actually go to start creating one of these things, it is really tricky to figure out, okay, how was that thing actually done? And to get into the modality of considering it and actually going deep, especially when it comes to something like art where... There are so many ways to create it. And the trick is not just to understand that it is created, but to understand how the work that you like is created and how you could actually create it and how that would help you to create art that really speaks about what you think is interesting about the world, to actually communicate through your medium, through process, those initial ideas. And then to get so good at that, that you can hide a lot of that process to people and present it to them in a way where they can really feel only your ideas and not necessarily some of the awkwardness and the failures and the mistakes and the happy accidents that occurred as you were going through the labor to actually create it. The bottom line is that when you go to the gallery show and you see the work on the wall, maybe it's fun to consider that the artist is a little bit tortured. Maybe that adds to the story, that adds to the flair that they encountered artistic block, that they are a mysterious human, that they created this amazing thing, that they are unique. It makes the work seem more interesting, more valuable, more unique, more mysterious if it is created in some non sort of linear, <laughs> very mundane way. Where the story helps, it will be told and understood. But fundamentally, what we want is to see the finished thing. Likewise, you want to fit, pick up your finished comic book and sort of appreciate it. You don't want to know about the sleepless nights and the arguments and the frustrations and all of the technique and the tools that went into creating it, the stained ink on your hands. I know people who used to work with traditional repeatograph pens. Those are the technical pencils and they would have a very, very little fine point, almost like a needle. And if you look, their hands are just completely stained with these kind of tattoos because every now and then over decades of work, if you're shaking that thing, you will just accidentally stab it into your hand and give yourself a little sort of pointed tattoo. No one wants to know about these things. They don't want to know about the cut fingers, about the sleepless nights, about the back pain that you get from being a comic book artist. They just want to see the fun, bombastic energy. That's what they came for. And I think this is why fundamentally you need to understand that process is something you're going to need to look for. And it's not just something that's kind of there. It's not just mundane. It's actually what you're going to spend most of your time doing. And it's the thing that you need to spend most of your time studying. Now, the reason that I go on so much about this and try and make this point is because I think often, even when we get a little bit into the ideas of process, even when you get a little bit interested in this, often I think we actually need to go deeper because the process is what we actually spend all our time doing. It's what we actually do. And refining it and understanding it is one of the best pathways to solve a lot of the artistic challenges that people are normally struggling to solve, such as how do I get a particular style and how do I enjoy this more? One of the real challenges that often happens is people like the end result of work and then they go to do it and they realize they don't actually like doing it. 
And I think this can often be because we haven't examined the process enough. And also, maybe you haven't found the right process. And I think really looking deeper at this idea of process is where you can look at not just how do you get the finished result, but how do you create things in a way that you enjoy? It's not always a matter of finding who you are as an artist in terms of the finished result. Mostly what you need to find is how you actually like creating work. For instance, you can create very sort of entertaining art in a variety of ways. If you look at entertainment style art, entertainment design, comic books, video games, illustration, drawing fantasy stuff, this is normally what I spend the vast majority of my time doing. There's many different ways that you can create art. As I was saying in the beginning, you can go from light to dark or dark to light. You can go from the middle out or with the line and color process, which is the process that I tend to use, you're kind of actually starting with all the high frequency detail. You're starting by doing this drawing and you kind of don't actually see it come together until the end. So often what's happening is that you are defining detail first or mood first and the way you experience the creation of the work is very different. If you are creating a work in a sort of digital painting style where you are sort of blocking things in, it's a little bit more like plain air painting where you often paint like very big brush strokes first. You get a very good understanding of how the painting is going to work. You refine the composition through that. You slowly build it up, building secondary form, finally tertiary form. You put in all the finished details and then finally it comes up. It sort of emerges in a more or less linear fashion. What's happening as you create art is that you are working on different things at different stages and there's a, there's a process and a sequence with which you do it. And often, I think, your personality is very much linked to that process and the way that you like to experience things. So I've often said that that way of creating art, where you see the work emerge, really suits people who like to think about the emotion first, who like to block things in in the beginning and then sort of slowly work it up and detail and detail and be able to kind of polish and polish the work. Whereas comic book art, you often don't really know what it's going to look like right until the end when it's all said and done, when you take the idea, you take the finished work and then you put the colors under it. And then finally, you kind of see what it's going to be like. It's a very different experience of creating work and a lot of people when they try to create work in one way and then they get really good at it and then you try and create it in a different way it can really throw them because the way that you experience the creation process is very different but I quite like doing it that way because it's a bit of a surprise I'm never quite sure whether the image is going to work until right at the end whereas if you're building a, a work up from you know the middle out you're getting the, the most kind of logical view of how it's going to work but there is a surprise that comes with comic book work where you are finally coloring it and then you're like oh that's what it looks like I was right it did work or maybe it doesn't work and there's nothing you can really do you've kind of drawn it already you can't tweak it you can't change it it's it's over there's a finality to that that I think fits with the production process that's required you can't go in and tweak it it's done you did your best but that works with deadlines we have something finished and it's done. The way that you experience these things and the way that you sort of work and the process that you use very much defines often the type of personality that you are as well. If you're the sort of type of person who wants to spend 40 hours on an illustration or 80 hours or maybe more, maybe a month on just a single image, a single painting, maybe a very large painting, the way that you're going to experience that, the dedication you're going to have, the patience you're going to have to have and the way that you're going to be able to, you know, prolong your gratification essentially to kind of having that thing finished is going to have to be really intense. And often you really need to be the right type of person to employ that type of process where there's multiple steps, you're doing color roughs, you're doing drawings, you're transferring the drawing. You're going to have drawn that thing a whole bunch of times. You're going to have painted it a whole bunch of times by the time you are finished. If you compare that to being a storyboard artist or a sketch artist, this is where you probably will never finish a drawing in your whole life. It's just not required. In fact, you do a much better job and you will create much better work if you learn how to not really finish your drawings that well. 
all of these things relate to the way that process creates a particular type of art. And these are very extreme examples, but hopefully they speak to the concept that the way that you experience the art is actually very much linked to who you are and your natural proclivities, your natural strengths and weaknesses as a human, not as an artist. How much patience do you have? How much do you like detail? What sort of things are you interested in? The way that you create art is not just linked to, oh, this is how you do that from A to B, but do you actually like doing that from A to B? And I think once we really start to examine process like this, what you find is that often the processes that are used to create different types of art, be it a storyboard, a comic, a manga, a finished illustration, uh, video game art, sculpture, sculpture that needs to be reproduced, right? It's probably very different to create just a sculpture that is a piece of art versus a sculpture that you cast and then maybe reproduce multiple times versus one time. That's a whole process. It's another thing where people don't often want to know how that's made. It's like, I just want to see them sculpting it with clay. You don't want to see the molds and pouring stuff in here and all that kind of stuff. That's just like, ah, oh, that's not interesting. I just want to see, I want, I want to see the fun stuff. So I think understanding process is where you really get to experiment and have fun with how the work is actually made. And I think it's really interesting here because often really finished art and polished things come out of very messy studios. And I think this is important to understand that the way things are made is often very different to the way they kind of look. And the type of people that create them are often very different to, you know, how you kind of imagine the work is going to be. I know lots of people who paint very terrifying things and horrific things, but they're very sort of normal straight laced people. And it's really just important to understand that the thing that defines us and links us all as artists is this idea of process and the way that we experience our work. And not only that, but the idea of process is very much linked to, and it is very forgiving, it is an iterative process. It is an evolutionary style process. Often the way that these things are created is with some ability to manipulate and change and play and experiment or find new efficiencies. So we are kind of aligning ourselves through really thinking about how things are created and spending most of our time there and our thought process there. We're kind of aligning ourselves with a lot of what is natural, I think, to life and to humans, which is kind of making things, you know, getting your hands dirty, essentially, and being able to imagine something and make it real, modify it. And especially with a lot of artwork, what you find is that processes are actually kind of very forgiving. Failure is a part of process. Often we see this finished result. We see the finished comic. You see the finished work of art on the wall. You see the finished thing. It's shiny. It's fancy. It has its story attached. It's marketed well to you. This is great. But often the thing is that part of the way that we kind of tell a good story about art is to maybe sort of say that it was created in a very linear fashion, that there was purpose to it. The fact that that thing that was created could have turned out a different way if the artist had gone left instead of right, if they zigged instead of zagged, I think is for most people terrifying. Because we like to imagine that things are created with some sense of order and purpose. But the reality, I think, is also that as creatives, we are creative and we do change things midway and we do have one idea and turn it into another idea and that that's part of what is interesting. And I think when you actually get on the creation side of things and you start looking more at process, less at finished work, you realize this is more creative, this is more fun, this is more forgiving. And often the reason that there are these steps, in the beginning you look at those steps and say, Oh, this just looks like a lot of work. Why don't I just draw the why don't I just draw the freaking thing in the end? It's like, well, because the process that is a part of those steps is one of discovery. And discovery is the fun thing. It's the way that you may sketch loosely three or four times. To the beginner, that may seem like you're just repeating the drawing. But once you get into it, once you have mastered that process, what you understand is that allows you to draw really fluidly, really, really fast, because you know. This is just the initial sketch. Now I'm going to refine this again. I'm going to refine this again. You have more steps. You feel very relaxed. You're, you're loose. You know, like, oh, this is okay. I'm going to have multiple chances to correct this along the way. This 
enhances the feeling of creativity. It allows you to fail. It allows you to experiment. It allows you to optimize to, you know, be part of that evolutionary experience where ideas are tried. Now, from an evolutionary perspective, it kind of sucks if you're the animal that didn't work and then you die. But from an idea perspective, it's okay for ideas to die. It's okay, it's okay for particular elements of our process to die for an idea to, you know, be forgotten because nothing's really lost. We focus on, thankfully, the finished result, the final apex predator that we stick on the wall. That's the thing that we get to appreciate. But the thing that you actually will find will make your life more fun is engaging in the process and often making it a little bit more longer, giving yourself time to play. That's where a lot of the actual fun as an artist is. The bottom line is that the more you can develop your process, the more you focus on it, the more relaxed you can be, the more creative you can be, and ultimately the more fun you will have as a creative. So... How do you actually do that? How, how do we actually maybe understand some of these concepts and apply them? Let's look at a few takeaways. Let's try to break it down firstly from an analytical point of view. I think there's a couple of things here that are worth saying. Firstly, art is actually made in most cases with multiple steps. Even if you are a uh, Jackson Pollock, you're one of these people who's like, no, no, I'm just spraying paint around there's still a process to it, right? There's still, there, there is an A to B that has been refined over time. Trust me, there have been many, many failed splatter paintings. This is something that has evolved. In the same way, you have Picasso experimenting with the concept of cubism. And the story that's told is like, this is just this experimental thing, right? We're just, you know, we're trying not to think about it too much. And we're just letting ourselves flow. But nevertheless, in order to do that, there's had to be a massive process to understand how the tools work, how all of these things function. And that, again, you may get to a point where a lot of those steps blend into one or you can skip them or you can avoid them or you can maybe go very directly from A to B. But nevertheless, those things are built on years and decades of experimenting with different processes to understand how these things work, to build technique and skill. Process fundamentally is multiple steps. It is a series of things that you do in order to arrive at a finished product. Also, these steps that we go through are unique to the artist. They're also unique to the tools that you're using and they're unique to the medium. That is to say that in a similar way, you can ask, hey, what pencil do you use? You can also ask an artist, what process do you use? And it'll give you a hint. But that may not be the way that you actually exactly follow that process in your own work. It is just an example of how they do it. What you're after is how you do it. And the way that you create work will be very unique. A lot of what we're looking at is combining these ideas of the way that tools are used and the way mediums are used and the way that these are generally produced. But understand that fundamentally, every artist's process is unique. It is their way of getting from A to B. Your goal is to find your way of getting from A to B. And that these steps that we go through, this thing that we call process, is actually what, what you spend most of your time experiencing day to day. This is your day to day lived experience as an artist is going through these steps and understanding how these steps relate to each other and that how you can use them to enhance your creativity, the feeling of the finished work, and also, again, that Part of this process is about hiding these steps from people. That's a major part of often what happens at the end as things are finished off. We disappear the brush strokes. We clean up all the tool marks and we make sure that things look really finished. But fundamentally, these things are things that define what you do all day. And they also define, in most cases, the finished look of the work that you actually create. The style, the process, in many cases, is style. It is the way that things are made. That's why they look that way. If you want a simple version of this, I've said it before, this is actually what you do as an artist. This is actually what you spend all your time doing. We're not making art, we're actually going through process. We're going from step A to B to C. Finally, as part of that, we get a finished product, but most of the time, the process is what you actually do. All right, let's look at some practical takeaways. Like how could you actually use this? The first thing should be pretty obvious, and that is that I think one of the things you can do 
to really sort of dig deep in this and, and not, not just kind of get better at drawing or art, but to really understand yourself as an artist, your preferences, how you like to be creative and how you're actually going to get your art to look a particular way is to study process, to really look at this, not just to study other people's processes. I think that's a really good thing to do is to find the artist that you like and look at how they create things. Secondly, to look at the tools that you're using and the processes that are typically optimized for those tools. If you're using watercolor, for instance, in most cases, it's a light to dark medium. And there's a particular way you're going to apply those sort of washers, right? It's also a build up medium, right? You're sort of building up layers. Not all work is like that. In some other ways of creating work, right? You know, again, you go from dark to light or you go from the middle out. Who knows? There's a huge variety of ways to create work. But look at how the artists that you really like are getting their work. Maybe you'll find some interesting insight there. Also look at how the tools are used. And lastly, the medium. There's often reasons why particular mediums have sort of a dominant technique or style. I, I often use the the idea of comic book art as a good example of why I think that's still used in the comic book medium. There are many examples of people painting comics, doing all sorts of things. A lot of these results look good. It's not necessarily about the finished result. What you tend to find is that comic book art, doing line and color art, is a very effective way to quickly get a really finished result that will print well. So it fits the medium. Often with comics, you need it to print well because the paper is often not that good. So you need art that is optimized for printing. Line and color work tends to be optimized for printing. It will always print quite well. Secondly, you are often on deadline. So you need a way to create polished work in a really quick way. And it's not one of these things where often you're getting a lot of changes or a lot of feedback. It's not like you're painting a finished cover or something like that, where you're going to get a whole bunch of changes and tweaks. These are often very sort of fast things. So what you want is a very, very quick, easy, effective way to create art. And also that medium is sort of optimized in many cases for people working on a production line, but for you to still have a lot of personality where it counts in the drawing and the inking. So again, what you find is if you're kind of cutting against the grain of how techniques and styles are used within a particular medium, you need to really be confident why you're doing that and not just kind of say, oh, I'm just going to do this to be different. Really look at because what you find in most cases, there are good reasons why particular processes and techniques are used in particular industries, in particular mediums. And that there are good reasons why particular tools tend to go with them. Sometimes those reasons can just be no reason. It's just because history. That's what we've always done. But what you'll find is there is often wisdom there. So you really have to look at that carefully. The other thing you can do practically is find the right one for you. And I really think here, this is the most important thing is within, within a given medium. Now, there are things that are really not going to work in a given medium. For instance, if you're doing concept art, there are particular styles that are going to really do better than others. They're going to allow you to optimize your process or work with the style of industry that it is. For instance, in concept art, you often get lots and lots of little changes. So people tend to develop styles and processes to allow them to make lots and lots of little changes. There are other industries where you're going to get a huge number of challenges, right? Storyboarding, another one of those industries where you really just want to be able to throw away a million drawings, right? And they don't matter. You don't ever want to put too much work into one of those storyboard drawings because it's probably going to get thrown away. Someone's going to ask for a change and then you're going to feel terrible. So there are reasons that things are created a particular way. Um, often, you know, it's concept art is mostly digital these days because that is what tends to work. It's also has a lot of 3D technique in it because that tends to be something that really works in that industry. People are often going to say, hey, can you show me that same thing you drew, but from a different angle? And then you do it and it's like a lot of work. And then, like, oh, how about you just shift it a little bit? That's very hard using some tools, but in others, again, if you use 3D, it's very easy. So there are often good reasons why tools and processes are used in a particular industry. Don't just ignore those and say, well, I'm going to do this in this industry. It's not kind of a smorgasbord where you can just pick anything. You do need to pay close attention to why these things are there. But most importantly, you need to look at which process is a right for you. And this might mean that what you find is you're more or less suited to particular industries, to particular jobs, to particular clients. 
that your proclivities and the way that you tend to function as an artist is going to be better suited to different things. But it is really important, I would say, to prioritize those natural proclivities because that is where you do get natural strengths and weaknesses. If you naturally have patience, it's probably worthwhile pursuing some type of career or to look for more work in an area where those proclivities are going to be a superpower. They're not going to work against you. I think that's really, really important. And I think it's also important to look at the fun you have and the joy you get from working in a particular way, despite maybe an industry that you also like working in a completely different way. So for instance, I do work in a line of color style. As I said, I kind of like it. I kind of like working in comic books and I like the way that you do a drawing and then you color it and then only at the end you kind of see it. It allows it, it allows me to see the work afresh. It's something very interesting that I don't get working other ways where I'm actually able to observe the work in a little bit more like a viewer, which as I've said is a major difference to the to the way you experience work. So looking at that and saying, well, I, I really like being able to see it a bit fresh right at the end, as opposed to when I'm painting something, I normally just kind of stop when I get sick of it. You get blind to work. And once you get blind to it, you kind of never see it again, right? It's a very, it's a very important part of how you experience your work. In many cases, you can be so blind to work because you've been working on it for so long that you, you kind of will never see it. It'll take you a decade to really look at it and be like, oh, that's what it looked like. So the way that you experience these things is very, very important and, and what you value about the work. And I think it's important to prioritize that a little bit more, even though it can be very frustrating because often some techniques, some styles, some mediums, some industries are much better paid than others. So yeah. Um, but as an example, you know, I do work a lot as a concept artist and it's just important for me to understand I'm cutting against the grain there. I'm doing something that isn't necessarily always the best, right? Working in painted styles, working in 3D can be more effective, but for me, I prioritize the way that I like to create the art and I try and build my career around that. Because again, I think it gives me more of an advantage overall. And it means that day to day, I'm working in a style and a process that I actually enjoy. So that is what I would recommend. Although, you know, look, this is completely up to you. Fundamentally, though, you have to find the right process for you and look carefully at how that's going to fit into the wider world. Lastly, if we look at a philosophical or a spiritual takeaway, this is where I really do think viewing this from a much more spiritual, like magical viewpoint is actually kind of interesting. I think it is good to view things this way. There is a weird sense where part of presenting a finished product, part of creating something is about hiding to people how it was done. If you look at, you know, something that would you would probably define as very simple, like a woven basket. If I look at a woven basket, I kind of don't know how that's made. Like I have no idea how that was actually created. It's very interesting to me how it's created, but but also the mystery of it, there's geometry to it, the way that the, you know, different sort of, you know, materials are sort of woven into each other. There's a mystery to that. Going back to our metaphor of a a wooden chair, right? Often you look at it and you're not quite sure how it's glued together. Uh, and it's only through really sort of examining it and you kind of look under it and you're like, oh, I kind of get how it works. There's often mechanisms where you kind of pull something out and it kind of works and then you kind of, we don't really know why. There's, I think, a certain amount of sort of joy and wonder that we get from that as people who are sort of buying and experiencing and having things. It's just being like, oh, I'm not quite sure how, this kind of feels like it was just made magically. That's often the result you kind of want. It's that sort of, um, Apple iPhone style, like it just kind of works thing that people are always trying to look for. You, you kind of want people to look past the production and look at how it really just directly influences them. And hiding the method of production, I think is a major part. It's probably one of the things that we tend to want to do. And this goes for every strata of creation, every single thing that humans do, like houses are a really good example of this. If you make houses and you look at how houses are constructed, you know, it's all pretty rough, right? But we have these magical things like the skirting board, right? The skirting board is the thing that kind of joins the wall to the floor. And often the floor and the wall don't join. 
if you actually take away the skirting board, right, it's not some sort of smooth thing. There's often a giant gap there. It's kind of completely messy. Often the, the boards aren't meeting. It's just a, but you know what? We put a skirting board there and most people are just like, oh, it's just a wall that goes there. It's interesting how the floorboards disappear and then the wall goes up there. Again, it can be made of a million different things, but often we have these little cornices and ways of hiding joins, hiding the way that things are kind of functionally made. And I think this is a major part of how things are actually created. This is one of the things you actually want to do, but you want to do it in the creation of your work. You don't want to do it as a part of learning to do it. As a part of learning to do it, part of being a magician is probably not quite being as entertained by most magic tricks, right? That's the reality of it is when you look at art and you spend your whole day creating art, part of what you see is the process. And that's sort of part of the interesting aspect of it. But, you know, you, you might see, and I think this is also something that's sort of interesting is like a lot of artists do actually share their process these days. There's a lot of artists who, as part of uh, the Instagram, their TikTok, their sort of social media presence, they have a lot of sort of step-by-step -step process. And it's, oh, I do this and I do this and I do this. And you may be saying like, well, no, no, everyone's sharing their process now. And I would say to you, no, they are not. I would say in most cases, the finished product in that instance is not really even the finished work. It is the video. Most people are focusing so much on the video and optimizing the way that that looks that I think that in itself is either the primary artwork or at least an, a secondary ancillary artwork that is being created. And in most cases, what you tend to find is that people who spend a lot of time doing that, again, this is just from my observational because I haven't done a lot of that myself, but people who spend a lot of time doing that, I think will actually change the way they draw. They'll change the way they create things in order to make it feel more magical, to make it feel as if it is more like how people imagine art is created. And I think this is why artists like the late King Zhong Ji were so popular is because people really got to see how they thought most drawing was done. And he got really good at that. He got really sort of good at, you know, creating these things and, and, and people really responded well to that. But I'd say, you know, in most cases, the thing that made that work really interesting was seeing it made. It was less so the finished product and more so seeing how it was done. And I think that is often the case when people are looking at these, you know, paintings created on uh, sort of Instagram or whatever as reels. Yeah, it's important to understand that, yeah, what you're seeing there is not the actual process. Why? Because as I know, I'm looking at five cameras right now, right? There's lights here, there's lights there. What you see is a finished product, right? And hopefully it is fairly finished. But what I see as a creator is editing, I've got video editing, I've got lighting on here. There's a whole bunch of stuff, right, that you don't see, okay? And so that's the important thing to understand is when people are presenting something to you and it feels like, oh, it's polished, oh, they're just doing that sort of thing and it's really fast and it's speed painted and often this, you see it kind of jumps. It's like, oh, here's a really fun bit where I put a nice little sort of stroke on there. And then, oh, it jumps to another bit where I've got another bit. And you kind of don't see all the bit in the middle, all the, you know, all the boring stuff. So it's always important to understand that what is the finished product you're looking at? What is the thing that we're trying to present as finished? And what is the process that is used to create it? So, Again, I think this goes for every strata of creation, including this, this thing that I'm making right now, right? I have a outline for this, right? I have a process that I use to, you know, sort of create it. Um, and it's very specific to the way that I like to create things. I don't like to write scripts. I've never liked to create scripts. As an artist, part of what I like about creating art, as well as everything else, is there's a certain level of performance there where it is unscripted. And I'm just kind of starting now to say, well, oh, maybe I'll talk about this and I'll show them that outline because that's how I like to create things. Other people on YouTube making podcasts and videos don't like to do it that way. They like to script it. They have a much more defined process. But either way, you don't see the cameras. You don't see the lights. And I think it's always important to understand that, that the look of what it's like to be on a film set is very different to the look of what it's like to go to the theater. All right, that's all we got time for on this particular episode. I thought this idea was worth sort of underlining. This is a really simple concept. I've been a process fiend. I've really been interested in how things have been made for a long time. But even for me, 
again, understanding these things has taken a long time to really figure out what do I like doing? And I certainly started many careers and got into doing a lot of things because I liked the idea of it and I didn't like doing it. And I've noticed a lot of people, most of the students who I talk to deal with this in one way, shape or form. So I thought it was worth kind of really putting, you know, a box around this, really sort of highlighting this idea. Hopefully it has been useful to your understanding of kind of what you are doing, what we're doing as artists. Let me know if you've got any questions in the sort of comments down below or send me an email, tim at the drawingcodex.com. Be really keen to know what you thought of this one. Other than that, catch you around in the next one. Yeah.